The War in the Air, Chapter 8, A World at War, Part 1. It was only very slowly that Bert got hold of this idea that the whole world was at war, that he formed any image at all of the crowded countries south of these arctic solitudes, stricken with terror and dismay as these newborn aerial navies swept across their skies. He was not used to thinking of the world as a whole, but as a limitless hinterland of happenings beyond the range of his immediate vision. Warren, his imagination, was something, a source of news and emotion, that happened in a restricted area called the seat of war. But now the whole atmosphere was the seat of war, and every land a cockpit. So closely had the nations raced along the path of research and invention, so secret and yet so parallel had been their plans and acquisitions, that it was within a few hours of the launching of the first fleet in Franconia that an Asiatic armada beat its westward way across, high above the marvelling millions in the plain of the Ganges. But the preparations of the Confederation of Eastern Asia had been on an altogether more colossal scale than the German. With this step, said Tan Ting Xiang, we overtake the West. We recover the peace of the world that those barbarians have destroyed. Their secrecy and swiftness and inventions had far surpassed those of the Germans. And where the Germans had had a hundred men at work, the Asiatics had ten thousand. There came to their great aeronautic parks at Chinsifu and Tsingyen by the monorails that now laced the whole surface of China a limitless supply of skilled and able workmen. Workmen far above the average European in industrial efficiency. The news of the German world's surprise simply quickened their efforts. At the time of the bombardment of New York, it is doubtful if the Germans had 300 airships altogether in the world. The score of Asiatic fleets flying east and west and south must have numbered several thousand. Moreover, the Asiatics had a real fighting flying machine, the Niao, as they were called, a light but quite efficient weapon, infinitely superior to the German Drakenflieger. Like that, it was a one-man machine, but it was built very lightly of steel and cane and chemical silk, with a transverse engine and a flapping side wing. The aeronaut carried a gun firing explosive bullets loaded with oxygen, and in addition, and true to the best tradition of Japan, a sword. Mostly they were Japanese, and it is characteristic that from the first it was contemplated that the aeronaut should be a swordsman. The wings of these flyers had bat-like hooks forward, by which they were to cling to their antagonist's gas chambers while boarding him. These light flying machines were carried with the fleets, and also sent overland or by sea to the front with the men. They were capable of flights of from two to five hundred miles according to the wind. So, hard upon the uprush of the first German air fleet, these Asiatic swarms took to the atmosphere. Instantly every organised government in the world was frantically and vehemently building airships and whatever approach to a flying machine its inventors had discovered. There was no time for diplomacy. Warnings and ultimatums were telegraphed to and fro, and in a few hours all the panic-fierce world was openly at war, and at war in the most complicated way. For Britain and France and Italy had declared war upon Germany, and outraged Swiss neutrality. India 
at the site of the Asiatic airships, had broken into a Hindu insurrection in Bengal and a Mohammedan revolt hostile to this in the northwest province, the latter spreading like wildfire from Gobi to the Gold Coast. And the Confederation of Eastern Asia has seized the oil wells of Burma and was impartially attacking America and Germany. In a week, they were building airships in Damascus and Cairo and Johannesburg, Australia and New Zealand were frantically equipping themselves. One unique and terrifying aspect of this development was the swiftness with which these monsters could be produced. To build an ironclad took from two to four years. An airship could be put together in as many weeks. Moreover, compared with even a torpedo boat, the airship was remarkably simple to construct. Given the air chamber material, the engines, the gas plant, and the design, it was really not more complicated and far easier than an ordinary wooden boat had been a hundred years before. And now from Cape Horn to Nova Zimbla, and from Canton round to Canton again, there were factories and workshops and industrial resources. And the German airships were barely in sight of the Atlantic waters. The first Asiatic fleet was scarcely reported from Upper Burma, before the fantastic fabric of credit and finance that had held the world together economically for a hundred years strained and snapped. A tornado of realisation swept through every stock exchange in the world. Banks stopped payment, business shrank and ceased. Factories ran on for a day or so by a sort of inertia, completing the orders of bankrupt and ins extinguished customers, then stopped. The New York Burt Smallway saw, for all its glare of light and traffic, was in the pit of an economic and financial collapse unparalleled in history. The flow of the food supply was already a little checked, and before the World War had lasted two weeks by the time, that is, that mass was rigged in Labrador, there was not a city or town in the world outside China, however far from the actual centres of destruction, where police and government were not adopting special emergency methods to deal with a want of food and glut of unemployed people. The special peculiarities of aerial warfare were of such a nature as to trend, once it had begun, almost inevitably towards social disorganisation. The first of these peculiarities was brought home to the Germans in their attack upon New York. The immense power of destruction an airship has over the thing below, and its relative inability to occupy or police or guard or garrison a surrendered position, necessarily, in the face of urban populations in a state of economic disorganisation and infuriated and starving, this led to violent and destructive collisions. And even where the air fleet floated inactive above, there would be civil conflict and passionate disorder below. Nothing comparable to this state of affairs had been known in the previous history of warfare, unless we take such a case as that of a 19th century warship attacking some large savage or barbaric settlement, or one of those naval bombardments that disfigure the history of Great Britain in the late 18th century. Then, indeed, there had been cruelties and destruction that faintly foreshadowed the horrors of aerial war. Moreover, before the 20th century, the world had had but one experience, and that a comparatively light one, in the communist insurrection of Paris, 1871, of the possibilities of a modern urban population under warlike stresses. A second peculiarity of airship war, as it first came to the world that also made for social collapse, was the ineffectiveness of the early airships against each other. Upon anything below they could rain explosives in the most deadly fashion, 
forts and ships and cities lay at their mercy. But unless they were prepared for a suicidal grapple, they could do remarkably little mischief to each other. The armament of the huge German airships, big as the biggest mammoth liners afloat, was one machine gun that could easily have been packed up on a couple of mules. In addition, when it became evident that the air must be fought for, the air sailors were provided with rifles with explosive bullets of oxygen or inflammable substance. But no airship at any time ever carried as much in the way of guns and armour as the smallest gunboat on the navy list had been accustomed to do. Consequently, when these monsters met in battle, they manoeuvred for the upper place, or grappled and fought like chunks, throwing grenades, fighting hand to hand in an entirely medieval fashion. The risks of a collapse and fall on either side came near to balancing, in every case, the chances of victory. As a consequence, and after their first experiences of battle, one finds a growing tendency on the part of the air fleet admirals to evade joining battle, and to seek rather the moral advantage of a destructive counter-attack. And if the airships were too ineffective, the early Drakenflieger were either too unstable, like the German, or too light, like the Japanese, to produce immediately decisive results. Later, it is true, the Brazilians launched a flying machine of a type and scale that was capable of dealing with an airship, but they built only three or four. They operated only in South America, and they vanished from history untraceably in the time when world bankruptcy put a stop to all further engineering production on any considerable scale. The third peculiarity of aerial warfare was that it was at once enormously destructive and entirely indecisive. It had this unique feature that both sides lay open to punitive attack. In all previous forms of war, both by land and sea, the losing side was speedily unable to raid its antagonist's territory and the communications. One fought on a front, and behind that front the winner's supplies and resources, his towns and factories and capital, the peace of his country, were secure. If the war was a naval one, you destroyed your enemy's battle fleet and then blockaded his ports, secured his coaling stations, and hunted down any stray cruisers that threatened your ports of commerce. But to blockade and watch a coastline is one thing, to blockade and watch the whole surface of a country is another, and cruisers and privateers are things that take long to make, that cannot be packed up and hidden and carried unostentatiously from point to point. In aerial war, the stronger side, even supposing it destroyed the main battle fleet of the weaker, had then either to patrol and watch or destroy every possible point at which he might produce another, and perhaps a novel and more deadly form of flyer. It meant darkening his air with airships. It meant building them by the thousand, and making aeronauts by the hundred thousand. A small, uninflated airship could be hidden in a railway shed, in a village street, in a wood. A flying machine is even less conspicuous. And in the air are no streets, no channels, no point where one can say of an antagonist, if he wants to reach my capital, he must come by here. In the air, all directions lead everywhere. Consequently, it was impossible to end a war by any of the established methods. A, having outnumbered and overwhelmed B, hovers, a thousand airships strong, over his capital, threatening to bombard it unless B submits. B replies by wireless telegraphy that he is now in the act of bombarding the chief manufacturing city of A, by means of three radar airships. A denounces B's radars as pirates and so forth, 
bombards B's capital and sets off to hunt down B's warships, while B, in a state of passionate emotion and heroic unconquerableness, sets to work amidst his ruins, making fresh airships and explosives for the benefit of A. The war had become perforce a universal guerrilla war, a war inextricably involving civilians and homes and all the apparatus of social life. These aspects of aerial fighting took the world by surprise. There had been no foresight to deduce these consequences. If there had been, the world would have arranged for a universal peace conference in 1900. But mechanical invention had gone faster than intellectual and social organisation. And the world, with its silly old flags, its silly, unmeaning tradition of nationality, its cheap newspapers and cheaper passions and imperialisms, its base commercial motives and habitual insincerities and vulgarities, its race lies and conflicts, was taken by surprise. Once the war began, there was no stopping it. The flimsy fabric of credit that had grown with no man foreseeing, and that had held those hundreds of millions in an economic interdependence that no man clearly understood, dissolved in panic. Everywhere went the airships, dropping bombs, destroying any hope of a rally, and everywhere below were economic catastrophe, starving workless people, rioting, and social disorder. Whatever constructive guiding intelligence there had been among the nations vanished in the passionate stresses of the time. Such newspapers and documents and histories as survived from this period all tell one universal story of towns and cities with the food supply interrupted and their streets congested with starving unemployed, of crises in administration and states of siege, of provisional governments and councils of defence, and, in the cases of India and Egypt, insurrectionary committees taking charge of the rearming of the population, and the making of batteries and gun pits, of the vehement manufacture of airships and flying machines. One sees these things in glimpses, in illuminated moments, as if through a driving reek of clouds going on all over the world. It was the dissolution of an age. It was the collapse of the civilization that had trusted to machinery, and the instruments of its destruction were machines. But while the collapse of the previous great civilization, that of Rome, had been a matter of centuries, had been a thing of phase and phase, like the aging and dying of a man, this, like his killing by railway or motor car, was one swift, conclusive, smashing, and an end. A World at War, Part 2 The early battles of the aerial war were no doubt determined by attempts to realise the old naval maxim, to ascertain the position of the enemy's fleet and to destroy it. There was first the battle of the Bernese Oberland, in which the Italian and French navigables, in their flank raid upon the Franconian Park, were assailed by a Swiss experimental squadron, supported as the day wore on by German airships, and then the encounter of the British Winterhouse Dunner aeroplanes with three unfortunate Germans. Then came the Battle of North India, in which the entire Anglo-Indian aeronautic settlement establishment fought for three days against overwhelming odds and was dispersed and destroyed in detail. And simultaneously, with the beginning of that, commenced the momentous struggle of the Germans and Asiatics that is usually known as the Battle of Niagara because of the objective for the Asiatic attack but it passed gradually into a sporadic conflict over half a continent. Such German airships as escaped destruction in battle descended and surrendered to the Americans, and were remanned, and in the end it became a series of pitiless and heroic encounters between the Americans, savagely resolved to exterminate their enemies 
and a continually reinforced army of invasion from Asia quartered upon the Pacific slope and supported by an immense fleet. From the first, the war in America was fought with implacable bitterness. No quarter was asked. No prisoners were taken. With ferocious and magnificent energy, the Americans constructed and launched ship after ship to battle and perish against the Asiatic multitudes. All other affairs were subordinate to this war. The whole population was presently living or dying for it. Presently, as I shall tell, the white men found in the butterage machine a weapon that could meet and fight the flying machines of the Asiatic swordsmen. The Asiatic invasion of America completely effaced the German-American conflict. It vanishes from history. At first, it had seemed to promise quite sufficiently tragedy in itself, beginning as it did in unforgettable massacre. After the destruction of central New York, all America had risen like one man, resolved to die a thousand deaths rather than submit to Germany. The Germans grimly resolved upon beating the Americans into submission, and, following out the plans developed by the Prince, had seized Niagara in order to avail themselves of its enormous power works, expelled all its inhabitants, and made a desert of its environs as far as Buffalo. They had also, directly Great Britain and France declared war, wrecked the country upon the Canadian side for nearly ten miles inland. They began to bring up men and material from the fleet off the east coast, stringing out to and fro like bees getting honey. It was then the Asiatic forces appeared, and it was in their attack upon this German base at Niagara that the air fleets of the east and west first met, and their greater issue became clear. One conspicuous peculiarity of the early aerial fighting arose from the profound secrecy with which the airships had been prepared. Each power had had but the dimmest inkling of the schemes of its rivals, and even experiments with its own devices were limited by the needs of secrecy. None of the designers of airships and aeroplanes had known clearly what their inventions might have to fight. Many had not imagined that they would have to fight anything whatever in the air, and had planned them only for dropping of explosives. Such had been the German idea. The only weapon for fighting another airship with which the Franconian fleet had been provided was the machine gun forward. Only after the fight over New York were the men given short rifles with detonating bullets. Theoretically, the Drakenflieger were to have been the fighting weapon. They were declared to be aerial torpedo boats, and the aeronaut was supposed to swoop close to his antagonist and cast his bombs as he whirled past. But indeed, these contrivances were hopelessly unstable. Not one third in any engagement succeeded in getting back to the mother airship. The rest were either smashed up or grounded. The allied Chino-Japanese fleet made the same distinction as the Germans between airships and fighting machines heavier than air. But the type in both cases was entirely different from the Occidental models, and it is eloquent of the vigour with which these great peoples took up and bettered the European methods of scientific research. In almost every particular, the invention of Asiatic engineers. Chief among these, it is worth remarking, was Mohini K. Chatterjee, a political exile who had formerly served in the British Indian Aeronautic Park at Lahore. The German airship was fish-shaped, with a blunted head. The Asiatic airship was also fish-shaped, but not so much on the lines of a cod or goby as of a ray or sole. It had a wide, flat underside, unbroken by windows or any opening except along the middle line. Its cabins occupied its axis, with a sort of bridge deck above, and the gas chambers 
gave the whole affair the shape of a gypsy's hooped tent, except that it was much flatter. The German airship was essentially a navigable balloon, very much lighter than air. The Asiatic airship was very little lighter than air, and skimmed through it with much greater velocity, if with considerably less stability. They carried fore and aft guns, the latter much the larger, throwing inflammatory shells, and in addition they had nests for riflemen on both the upper and the under side. Light as this armament was, in comparison with the smallest gunboat that ever sailed, it was sufficient for them to outfight as well as outfly the German monster airships. In action, they flew to get behind or over the Germans. They even dashed underneath, avoiding only passing immediately beneath the magazine, and as soon as they had crossed, let fly with their rear gun, and sent flares or oxygen shells into the antagonists' gas chambers. It was not in their airships, but, as I have said, in their flying machines proper, that the strength of the Asiatics lay. Next only to the Butteridge machine, these were certainly the most efficient heavier-than-air flyers that had ever appeared. They were the invention of a Japanese artist, and they differed in type extremely from the box-kite quality of the German Drakenflieger. They had curiously curved, flexible side wings, more like bent butterflies' wings than anything else, and made of a substance like celluloid and of brightly painted silk, and they had a long hummingbird tail. At the forward corner of the wings were hooks, rather like the claws of a bat, by which the machine could catch and hang and tear at the walls of an airship's gas chamber. The solitary rider sat between the wings above a transverse explosive engine, an explosive engine that differed in no essential particular from those in use in the light motor bicycles of the period. Below was a single large wheel. The rider sat astride of a saddle, as in the Butteridge machine, and he carried a large double-edged two-handed sword in addition to his explosive bullet-firing rifle. A World at War, Part 3 One sets down these particulars and compares the points of the American and German pattern of aeroplane and navigable, but none of these facts were clearly known to any of those who fought in this monstrously confused battle above the American Great Lakes. Each side went into action against it knew not what, under novel conditions, and with apparatus that even without hostile attacks was capable of producing the most disconcerting surprises. Schemes of action, attempts at collective manoeuvring, necessarily went to pieces directly the fight began, just as they did in almost all of the early ironclad battles of the previous century. Each captain then had to fall back upon individual action and his own devices, one would see triumph in what another read as a cue for flight and despair. It is as true of the Battle of Niagara as of the Battle of Lissa, that it was not a battle but a bundle of battleettes. To such a spectator as Bert, it presented itself as a series of incidents, some immense, some trivial, but collectively incoherent. He never had a sense of any plain issue joined, of any point struggled for and won or lost. He saw tremendous things happen, and in the end his world darkened to disaster and ruin. He saw the battle from the ground, from Prospect Park, and from Goat Island, whither he fled. But the manner in which he came to be on the ground needs explaining. The prince had resumed command of his fleet through wireless telegraphy long before the Zeppelin had located his encampment in Labrador. By his direction, the German air fleet, whose advance scouts had been in contact with the Japanese over the Rocky Mountains, had concentrated upon Niagara and awaited his arrival. 
He had rejoined his command early in the morning of the 12th, and Bert had his first prospect of the gorge of Niagara while he was doing net drill outside the middle gas chamber at sunrise. The Zeppelin was flying very high at the time, and far below he saw the water in the gorge, marbled and froth, and then away to the west, the great crescent of the Canadian Fall shining, flickering, and foaming in the level sunlight, and sending up a deep, incessant thudding rumble to the sky. The air fleet was keeping station in an enormous crescent, with its horns pointing southwestward, a long array of shining monsters with tails rotating slowly, and German ensigns now trailing from their bellies aft of their Marconi pendants. Niagara City was still largely standing then, albeit its streets were empty of all life. Its bridges were intact, its hotels and restaurants still flying flags and inviting sky signs, its power stations running. But about it, in the country, on both sides of the gorge, might have been swept by a colossal broom. Everything that could possibly give cover to an attack upon the German position at Niagara had been levelled as ruthlessly as machinery and explosives could contrive. Houses blown up and burnt, woods burnt, fences and crops destroyed, the monorails had been torn up, and the roads in particular cleared of all possibility of concealment or shelter. Seen from above, the effect of this wreckage was grotesque. Young woods had been destroyed wholesale by dragging wires, and the spoilt saplings, smashed or uprooted, lay in swathes like corn after the sickle. Houses had an appearance of being flattened down by the pressure of a gigantic finger. Much burning was still going on, and large areas had been reduced to patches of smouldering and sometimes still glowing blackness. Here and there lay the debris of belated fugitives, carts, and dead bodies of horses and men. And where houses had had water supplies, there were pools of water and running springs from the ruptured pipes. In unscorched fields, horses and cattle still fed peacefully. Beyond this desolated area, the countryside was still standing, but almost all the people had fled. Buffalo was on fire to an enormous extent, and there were no signs of any efforts to grapple with the flames. Niagara City itself was being rapidly converted to the needs of a military depot. A large number of skilled engineers had already been brought from the fleet and were busily at work adapting the exterior industrial apparatus of the place to the purposes of an aeronautic park. They had made a gas recharging station at the corner of the American Fall, above the Funicular Railway and they were opening up a much larger area to the south for the same purpose. Over the powerhouses and hotels and such like prominent or important points, the German flag was flying. The Zeppelin circled slowly over the scene, twice while the prince surveyed it from the swinging gallery. It then rose towards the centre of the crescent and transferred the prince and his suite Kurt included, to the Hohenzollern, which had been chosen as the flagship during the impending battle. They were swung up on a small cable from the forward gallery, and the men of the Zeppelin manned the outer netting as the prince and his staff left them. The Zeppelin then came about, circled down, and grounded in Prospect Park, in order to land the wounded and take aboard explosives for she had come to Labrador with her magazines empty, it being uncertain what weight she might need to carry. She also replenished the hydrogen in one of her forward chambers, which had leaked. Bert was detailed as a bearer and helped carry the wounded one by one into the nearest of the large hotels that faced the Canadian shore. The hotel was quite empty, except 
that there were two trained American nurses and a porter, and three or four Germans awaiting them. Bert went with the Zeppelin's doctor into the main street of the place, and they broke into a drug shop and obtained various things of which they stood in need. As they returned, they found an officer and two men making a rough inventory of the available material in the various stores. Except for them, the wide main street of the town was quite deserted. The people had been given three hours to clear out, and everybody, it seemed, had done so. At one corner, a dead man lay against the wall, shot. Two or three dogs were visible up the empty vista, but towards its river end, the passage of a string of monorail cars broke the stillness and the silence. They were loaded with hose and were passing to the train full of workers who were converting Prospect Park into an airship dock. Bert pushed a case of medicine balanced on a bicycle taken from an adjacent shop to the hotel, and then he was sent to load bombs into the Zeppelin magazine, a duty that called for elaborate care. From his job, he was presently called off by the captain of the Zeppelin, who sent him with a note to the officer in charge of the Anglo-American Power Company, for the field telephone had still to be adjusted. Bert received his instructions in German, whose meaning he guessed, and saluted and took the note, not caring to betray his ignorance of the language. He started off with a bright air of knowing his way, and turned a corner, or so, and was only beginning to suspect that he did not know where he was going, when his attention was recalled to the sky by the report of a gun from the Hohenzollern and celestial cheering. He looked up and found the view obstructed by the houses on either side of the street. He hesitated, and then curiosity took him back towards the bank of the river. Here his view was inconvenienced by trees, and it was with a start that he discovered the zeppelin, which he knew had still a quarter of her magazines to fill, was rising over Goat Island. She had not waited for her complement of ammunition. It occurred to him that he was left behind. He ducked back among the trees and bushes until he felt secure from any afterthought on the part of the Zeppelin's captain. Then his curiosity to see what the German air fleet faced overcame him and drew him at last halfway across the bridge to Goat Island. From that point he had nearly a hemisphere of sky and got his first glimpse of the Asiatic airships low in the sky above the glittering tumults of the upper rapids. They were far less impressive than the German ships. He could not judge the distance and they flew edgeways to him so as to conceal the broader aspect of their bulk. Bert stood there in the middle of the bridge, in a place that most people who knew it remembered as a place populous with sightseers and excursionists. And he was the only human being in sight there. Above him, very high in the heavens, the contending air fleets manoeuvred. Below him, the river seized like a sluice towards the American fall. He was curiously dressed. His cheap blue serge trousers were thrust into German airship rubber boots, and on his head he wore an aeronaut's white cap that was a trifle too large for him. He thrust that back to reveal his staring little cockney face still scarred upon the brow. Gaw! he whispered. He stared. He gesticulated. Once or twice he shouted and applauded. Then at a certain point... Terror seized him, and he took to his heels in the direction of Goat Island. A World at War, Part 4 For a time after they were in sight of each other, neither fleet attempted to engage. The Germans numbered 67 great airships, and they maintained the crescent formation at a height of nearly 4,000 feet. They kept a distance of about one and a half lengths so that the horns of the crescent were nearly 30 miles apart. Closely in tow of the airships of the extreme squadrons on either wing were about 30 Drakenflieger, ready manned. 
but these were too small and distant for Bert to distinguish. At first, only what was called the southern fleet of the Asiatics was visible to him. It consisted of 40 airships, carrying altogether nearly 400 one-man flying machines upon their flanks, and for some time it flew slowly and at a minimum distance of perhaps a dozen miles from the Germans, eastward across their front. At first Bert could distinguish only the greater bulks, then he perceived the one-man machines as a multitude of very small objects drifting like motes in the sunshine about and beneath the larger shapes. Bert saw nothing then of the second fleet of the Asiatics, though probably that was coming into sight of the Germans at the time in the northwest. The air was very still, the sky almost without a cloud, and the German fleet had risen to an immense height, so that the airships seemed no longer of any considerable size. Both ends of their crescent showed plainly. As they beat southward, they passed slowly between Bert and the sunlight, and became black outlines of themselves. The Drakenflieger appeared as little flecks of black on either wing of this aerial armada. The two fleets seemed in no hurry to engage. The Asiatics went far away to the east, quickening their pace and rising as they did so, and then tailed out into a long column and came flying back, rising towards the German left. The squadrons of the latter came about, facing this oblique advance, and suddenly little flickerings and a faint, crepitating sound told that they had opened fire. For a time no effect was visible to the watcher on the bridge. Then, like a handful of snowflakes, the Drakenflieger swooped to the attack, and a multitude of red specks whirled up to meet them. It was to Bert's sense not only enormously remote, but singularly inhuman. Not four hours since he had been on one of those very airships, and yet they seemed to him now not gas bags carrying men, but strange sentient creatures that moved about and did things with a purpose of their own. The flight of the Asiatic and German flying machines joined and dropped earthward, became like a handful of white and red rose petals flung from a distant window, grew larger, until Bert could see the overturned ones spinning through the air, and were hidden by great volumes of dark smoke that were rising in the direction of Buffalo. For a time they were all hidden, then two or three white and a number of red ones rose again into the sky, like a swarm of big butterflies, and circled fighting and drove away out of sight again towards the east. A heavy report recalled Bert's eyes to the zenith, and behold, the great crescent had lost its dressing and burst into a disorderly long cloud of airships. One had dropped halfway down the sky. It was flaming fore and aft, and even as Bert looked, it turned over and fell, spinning over and over itself, and vanished into the smoke of buffalo. Bert's mouth opened and shut, and he clutched tighter on the rail of the bridge. For some moments, they seemed long moments. The two fleets remained without any further change, flying obliquely towards each other, and making what came to Bert's ears as a midget uproar. Then suddenly, from either side, airships began dropping out of alignment, smitten by missiles. He could neither see nor trace. The string of Asiatic ships swung round and either charged into or over, it was difficult to say from below, the shattered line of the Germans, who seemed to open out to give way to them. Some sort of manoeuvring began, but Bert could not grasp its import. The left of the battle became a confused dance of airships. For some minutes up there, the two crossing lines of ships looked so close it seemed like a hand-to-hand -hand scuffle in the sky. Then they broke up into groups and duels. 
the descent of German airships towards the lower sky increased. One of them flared down and vanished far away in the north. Two dropped with something twisted and crippled in their movements. Then a group of antagonists came down from the zenith in an eddying conflict. Two Asiatics against one German and were presently joined by another and drove away eastward altogether with others dropping out of the German line to join them. One Asiatic either rammed or collided with a still more gigantic German and the two went spinning to destruction together. The northern squadron of Asiatics came into the battle unnoted by Bert, except that the multitude of ships above seemed presently increased. In a little while the fight was utter confusion, drifting on the hull to the southwest against the wind. It became more and more a series of group encounters. Here a huge German airship flamed earthward with a dozen flat Asiatic craft about her crushing her every attempt to recover. Here another hung with its screw, fighting off the swordsmen from a swarm of flying machines. Here again an Asiatic aflame at either end swooped out of the battle. His attention went from incident to incident in the vast clearness overhead. These conspicuous cases of destruction caught and held his mind. It was only very slowly that any sort of scheme manifested itself between those nearer, more striking episodes. The mass of the airships that eddied remotely above was, however, neither destroying nor destroyed. The majority of them seemed to be going at full speed and circling upward for position, exchanging ineffectual shots as they did so. Very little ramming was essayed after the first tragic downfall of Rama and Rand, and whatever attempts at boarding were made were invisible to Bert. There seemed, however, a steady attempt to isolate antagonists, to cut them off from their fellows and bear them down, causing a perpetual sailing back and interlacing of these shoaling bulks. The greater numbers of the Asiatics and their swifter healing movements gave them the effect of persistently attacking the Germans. Overhead, and evidently endeavouring to keep itself in touch with the works of Niagara, a body of German airships drew itself together into a compact phalanx, and the Asiatics became more and more intent upon breaking this up. He was grotesquely reminded of fish in a fish pond struggling for crumbs. He could see puny puffs of smoke and the flash of bombs, but never a sound came down to him. A flapping shadow passed for a moment between Bert and the sun, and was followed by another, a whirring of engines. Click, clock, clitter, clock, smote upon his ears. Instantly he forgot the zenith. Perhaps a hundred yards above the water, out of the south, Riding like Valkyries swiftly through the air on the strange steeds the engineering of Europe had begotten upon the artistic inspiration of Japan, came a long string of Asiatic swordsmen. The wings flapped jerkily, click, clock, clitter, clock, and the machines drove up. They spread and ceased, and the apparatus came soaring through the air. So they rose and fell and rose again. They passed so closely overhead that Bert could hear their voices calling to one another. They swooped towards Niagara City and landed, one after another, in a long line in a clear space before the hotel. But he did not stay to watch them land. One yellow face had craned over and looked at him, and for one enigmatic instant met his eyes. It was then the idea came to Bert that he was altogether too conspicuous in the middle of the bridge, and that he took to his heels toward Goat Island, thence dodging about among the trees, with perhaps an excessive self-consciousness, he watched the rest of the struggle. A World at War, Part 5 When Bert's sense of security was sufficiently restored for him to watch the battle again, 
he perceived that a brisk little fight was in progress between the Asiatic aeronauts and the German engineers for the possession of Niagara City. It was the first time in the whole course of the war that he had seen anything resembling fighting as he had studied it in the illustrated papers of his youth. It seemed to him almost as though things were coming right. He saw men carrying rifles and taking cover and running briskly from point to point in a loose attack formation. The first batch of aeronauts had probably been under the impression that the city was deserted. They had grounded in the open near Prospect Park and had approached the houses towards the power works before they were disillusioned by a sudden fire. They had scattered back to the cover of a bank near the water. It was too far for them to reach their machines again. They were lying and firing at the men in the hotels and frame houses about their power works. Then to their support came a second string of red flying machines driving up from the east. They rose up out of the haze above the houses and came round in a long curve as if surveying the position below. The fire of the Germans rose to a roar and one of those soaring shapes gave an abrupt jerk backwards and fell among the houses. The others swooped down exactly like great birds upon the roof of the powerhouse. They caught upon it, and from each sprang a nimble little figure and rang towards the parapet. Other flapping bird shapes came into this affair, but Bert had not seen their coming. A staccato of shots came over to him, reminding him of army manoeuvres, of newspaper descriptions of fights, of all that was entirely correct in his conception of warfare. He saw quite a number of Germans running from the outlying houses towards the powerhouse. Two fell, one lay still, but the other wriggled and made efforts for a time. The hotel that was used as a hospital, and to which he had helped carry the wounded men from the Zeppelin earlier in the day, suddenly ran up the Geneva flag. The town that had seemed so quiet and evidently been concealing a considerable number of Germans, and they were now concentrating to hold the central powerhouse. He wondered what ammunition they might have. More and more of the Asiatic flying machines came into the conflict. They had disposed of the unfortunate German Drakenflieger, and were now aiming at the incipient aeronautic park the electric gas generators and repair stations which formed the German base. Some landed, and their aeronauts took cover and became energetic infantry soldiers. Others hovered above the fight, their men ever and again firing shots down at some chance exposure below. The firing came in paroxysms. Now there would be a watchful lull, and now a rapid tattoo of shots rising to a roar. Once or twice, flying machines, as they circled warily, came right overhead, and for a time Bert gave himself body and soul to cowering. Ever and again, a large thunder mingled with the rattle, and reminded him of the grapple of airships far above. But the nearer fight held his attention. Abruptly something dropped from the zenith, something like a barrel or a huge football, Crash! It smashed with an immense report. It had fallen among the grounded Asiatic aeroplanes that lay among the turf and flower beds near the river. They flew in scraps and fragments. Turf, trees, and gravel leapt and fell. The aeronauts still lying along the canal bank were thrown about like sacks. Cat's paws flew across the foaming water. All the windows of the hotel hospital that had been shiningly reflecting blue sky and airships at the moment before became vast black stars. Bang! A second followed. Bert looked up and was filled with a sense of a number of monstrous bodies swooping down, coming down on the whole affair like a flight of bellying blankets, like a string of vast dish covers. 
The central tangle of the battle above was circling down as if to come into touch with the powerhouse fight. He got a new effect of airships altogether, as vast things coming down upon him, growing swiftly larger and larger and more overwhelming, until the houses over the way seemed small, the American rapid narrow, the bridge flimsy, the combatants infinitesimal. As they came down they became audible, as a complex of shootings and vast creakings and groanings and beatings and throbbings and shouts and shots. The foreshortened black eagles at the four ends of the Germans had an effect of actual combat of flying feathers. Some of these fighting airships came within 500 feet of the ground. Bert could see men on the lower galleries of the Germans firing rifles, could see Asiatics clinging to the ropes, saw one man in aluminium diver's gear fall flashing headlong into the waters above Goat Island. For the first time he saw the Asiatic airships closely. From this aspect, they reminded him more than anything else of colossal snowshoes. They had a curious patterning in black and white, in forms that reminded him of the engine-turned cover of a watch. They had no hanging galleries, but from little openings on the middle line peeped out men and the muzzles of guns. So, driving in long, descending and ascending curves, these monsters wrestled and fought. It was like clouds fighting, like puddings trying to assassinate each other. They whirled and circled about each other, and for a time threw Goat Island and Niagara into a smoky twilight, through which the sunlight smote in shafts and beams. They spread and closed and spread and grappled and drove round over the rapids, and two miles away or more into Canada, and back over the falls again. A German caught fire, and the whole crowd broke away from her flare, and rose about her dispersing, leaving her to drop towards Canada, and blow up as she dropped. Then, with renewed uproar, the others closed again. Once from the men in Niagara City came a sound like an anthill cheering, Another German burnt, and one, badly deflated by the prow of an antagonist, flopped out of action southward. It became more and more evident that the Germans were getting the worst of the unequal fight. More and more, obviously, were they being persecuted. Less and less did they seem to fight with any object other than escape. The Asiatics swept by them and above them, ripped their bladders, set them alight, picked off their dimly seen men in diving clothes who struggled against fire and tear with fire extinguishers and silk ribbons in the inner netting. They answered only with ineffectual shots. Thence the battle circled back over Niagara, and then suddenly the Germans, as if at preconcerted signal, broke and dispersed, going east, west, north and south, in open and confused flight. The Asiatics, as they realised this, rose to fly above them and after them. Only one little knot of four Germans and perhaps a dozen Asiatics remained fighting about the Hohenzollern and the Prince as he circled in a last attempt to save Niagara. Round they swooped once again over the Canadian Fall over the waste of waters eastward, until they were distant and small, and then round and back, hurrying, bounding, swooping towards the one gaping spectator. The whole struggling mass approached very swiftly, growing rapidly larger, and coming out black and featureless against the afternoon sun and above the blinding welter of the upper rapids. It grew like a storm cloud, until once more it darkened the sky. The flat Asiatic airships kept high above the Germans and behind them, and fired unanswered bullets into their gas chambers and upon their flanks. 
The one-man flying machines hovered and alighted like a swarm of attacking bees. Nearer they came, and nearer, filling the lower heaven. Two of the Germans swooped and rose again, but the Hohenzollern had suffered too much for that. She lifted weakly, turned sharply as if to get out of the battle, burst into flames fore and aft, swept down to the water, splashed into it obliquely, and rolled over, and over, and came downstream, rolling and smashing and writhing, like a thing alive, halting and then coming on again, with her torn and bent propeller still beating the air. The bursting flames spluttered out again in clouds of steam. It was a disaster gigantic in its dimensions. She lay across the rapids like an island, like tall cliffs, tall cliffs that came rolling, smoking and crumpling and collapsing, advancing with a sort of fluctuating rapidity upon Bert. One Asiatic airship, it looked to Bert from below, like three hundred yards of pavement, whirled back and circled two or three times over that great overthrow. And half a dozen crimson flying machines danced for a moment, like great midges in the sunlight, before they swept on after their fellows. The rest of the fight had already gone over the island, a wild crescendo of shots and yells and smashing uproar. It was hidden from Bert now by the trees of the island, and forgotten by him in the nearer spectacle of the huge advance of the defeated German airship. Something fell with a mighty smashing and splintering of bows unheeded behind him. It seemed for a time that the Hohenzollern must needs break her back upon the parting of the waters. And then for a time her propeller flopped and frothed in the river and thrust the mass of buckling crumpled wreckage towards the American shore. Then the sweep of the torrent that foamed down to the American fall quarter, and in another minute the immense mass of deflating wreckage, with flames spurting out in three new places, had crashed against the bridge that joined Goat Island and Niagara City, and forced a long arm, as it were, in a heaving tangle under the central span. Then the middle chambers blew up with a loud report, and in another moment the bridge had given way, and the main bulk of the airship, like some grotesque cripple in rags, staggered, flapping and waving flambeau to the crest of the fall, and hesitated there, and vanished in a desperate suicidal leap. Its detached fore-end remained jammed against that little island, Green Island it used to be called, which forms the stepping stone between the mainland and Goat Island's patch of trees. Bert followed this disaster from the parting of the waters to the bridgehead. Then, regardless of cover, regardless of the Asiatic airship hovering like a huge house roof without walls above the suspension bridge, he sprinted along towards the north and came out for the first time upon that rocky point by Luna Island that looks sheer down upon the American fall. There he stood breathless amidst that eternal rush of sound, breathless and staring. Far below, and travelling rapidly down the gorge, whirled something like an empty sack. For him it meant... What did it not mean? The German air fleet, Kurt, the Prince, Europe, all things stable and familiar, the forces that had brought him, the forces that had seemed indisputably victorious, and it went down the rapids like an empty sack, and left the visible world to Asia, to yellow people beyond the Christendom, to all that was terrible and strange. Remote over Canada receded the rest of that conflict, and vanished beyond the range of his vision.